Hello and welcome back. So up next, we have our session, 5G Fixed Wireless Access to and Through the Home, sponsored by Comscope. So without any further ado, I'll hand you straight over to the speakers. All right, thank you, Oliver, and thank you, audience, uh, for joining us today um, on the 5G Blitz Week. Uh, we're going to talk about fixed wireless access, one of the leading use cases, if you will, for 5G. You've seen a lot about fixed wireless access. We're going to talk uh, about FWA, you know, from the outside of the home all the way through the inside of the home. And joining me today, I have a actually a wonderful panel. Um, we have um, a couple of folks here from Comscope as well as from US Cellular. And I'll go ahead and have each of them introduce themselves briefly first. Um, I'll go first to Narotham, if you could introduce yourself, please. Hi, good morning and thanks, Roy. So my name is Narotham Saxena. I'm with US Cellular, uh, the fourth largest carrier serving about 5 million uh, consumer and business customers in 21 states. Uh, we have launched 5G across all our markets and portions of all our markets, and we'll be launching additional areas. So we started our journey on fixed wireless access a few years ago. We started with a 4G LTE product, uh, and we had pretty good success with it. And now we have expanded that to 5G low band. And late last year, we expanded further to millimeter wave uh, in about 30 cities. Uh, this year, we are focused on mid-band, which is C-band and 3.45 gigahertz. So, thank you. Excellent. Thank you for joining us. Um, next, I'll go to Charles. Charles, introduce yourself, please. Hey, I'm Charles Chivers. I'm the CTO of Comscope's Home Division. So, my job is to look at the, the future requirements of the home, be it fixed wireless access or a wired home. They all equalize at the same kind of Wi-Fi connection through the home. And um, so glad to be here today. Excellent. Thank you, Charles. And we also have Ken. Ken, introduce yourself, please. Yeah, thanks, Roy. Hi, Ken Haas. Uh, I look after the global product line management team for Comscope Home Networks. Uh, that encompasses all of our broadband solutions across uh, every possible WAN access technology into the home, including fixed wireless, as well as our video uh, devices portfolio as well. Excellent. Thank you for joining us, Ken. And so today, um, for the audience, uh, we're going to break our discussion up into a couple of themes. Um, we're not going to do the usual slide presentation first, and then after that, we'll jump into the panel. We're going to make it interactive right from the get-go, um, and hopefully you'll find it interesting. We're going to save about 10 to 15 minutes at the end for questions. So if you have any questions, feel free to use a Q&A window. I mean, you can put stuff in chat as well. But obviously, it's a little better if you put in Q&A so that we can actually see your questions in the right place. So once again, we encourage you to ask questions. We want to make this really interactive, not just amongst our four of us, but also with the audience. And hopefully, with the experts here, we'll be able to answer some of the pressing questions that you have around fixed wireless access. So as I said, we have four themes. Um, and I'll, I'll break them down very briefly. I will start with the business of fixed wireless access. Then we'll talk about the deployment journey and the learnings that we've had. Certainly, we've been doing this for a couple of years now, um, not very long, but we have experience doing that. Um, and likewise, as we promised, we're, we're going to talk about fixed wireless access and the home network, which is just as important in terms of your access and the quality of the service you're getting uh, to your devices. And then finally, the last theme or theme number four, we'll talk about the evolution of fixed wireless access. What can we expect? So let's start with the first theme, theme number one, the business of fixed wireless access. And we're going to start with a couple of slides to talk about some of the key business drivers here. And what you'll see is us jumping across a couple of slides to make a point, um, but also at the same time, you know, answering some of the key questions um, that we I know the audience likely you will have. Um, but again, put those in Q&A and we'll address them along the way as well. So I'll start with putting up this slide, you know, behind the business drivers, and I'll go first to Narotham. But as you'll see in the panel, super interactive. I'm sure we're going to have Charles and we're going to have Ken jumping right in. So very, very basic question. What are the drivers behind fixed wireless access demand from both consumers and the enterprise? Narotham, you've had some experience there. Would you like to share that? Oh. There are three um, primary core drivers. Uh, can you can hear me? Now we can hear you. Yes, before we couldn't, now we can. Okay, so I'll start off on the consumer side. 
there are three primary core drivers of demand for fixed wireless access. First, in rural and uh, underserved communities where there is no good connectivity solutions, customers see fi fixed wireless access as their only choice of broadband connectivity. And in areas where they might have DSL or satellite, then they view fixed wireless access as a product with enhanced experience. Second one being, we're seeing that there's a growing base of uh, dissatisfied cable cost subscribers who want to cut the card and they're attracted to the simplicity and freedom of fixed wireless access offered by wireless operators. So today, we see a good, good portion of uh, FWA customers originating from this population. And the third driver on the consumer side would be, uh, we see a segment of uh, value seekers who are migrating to fixed wireless access to leverage the uh, bundle pricing being offered by carriers. On the enterprise side, uh, I see primarily two drivers. One, that we see fixed wireless being able to supplement the current fiber and cable deployments by way of providing failover uh, and uh, redundancy link uh, to their existing pr primary service. And the other one is like on the enterprise side, the fixed wireless uh, access offers more flexibility and ability for them to connect locations consistently. There's also an undertone of reliability that we hear uh, being expressed by some of the customers who cite frequent outages or slow delivery with their current provider. In those cases, fixed wireless acts as a prime replacement solution for DSL and satellite deployments, uh, offering better better service and much much better economics. Yeah, so excellent. So themes of better services, better economics. Um, Charles, can go ahead and feel free to jump around the slides as well. I mean, the slides are there. Um, you know, feel free to double click on each of them and they'll they'll show up. So, let's go to Charles first. Charles, any thoughts you'd like to add to that? Well, I, I think you know. As Narotham said, there's a cost value. Uh oh. oh. <laughs> we lost Charles, but can we? Lost. Yeah, I'll yeah. pick. I'll, I'll I'll pick it up. Um, yeah, we're, I, Charles was going the same place I would have gone anyway. So from a, you know, cost value perspective, we've you know we we've really been talking a lot with our customers or our potential customers in regards to where the market is going. And there's been a lot of surveys done uh, with customers in Narotham. I'm sure you're very familiar with this, right? But there's there's definitely an, an economic aspect to where customers' heads are at right now, uh, especially as we're heading into uh, belt tightening times, you know, with where the economy is right now. Um, mm. We it, It's very interesting to see that, that uh, as the charts are showing, that, that there are you know, 59% of the customers that or the folks that were surveyed actually said they'd they'd be more interested in a slight decrease in price than any increase in performance or one gig type performance, uh, which makes perfect sense considering where where things are now. Maybe maybe three years ago it might have been a different answer, or two years ago it might have been a different answer as everybody was racing to get to one gig, but uh, but right now it does seem like there's I'll call it a little more common sense coming into the market in regards to. Uh, the value of of the service and how much speed you really do need um, coming into your home. It does also come down a little bit to the choices that are available. So on the upper part of the chart, it actually shows that almost 40% of customers have very limited amounts of, of uh, options in regards to choosing their, their broadband provider. And that would lead to someone coming into the market uh, rapidly with a much easier to deploy fixed wireless type of solution to be able to come in and actually grab some market share as well. Charles, uh, I think I covered what you were going to talk to when, when we lost. Yeah, I am on a word connection. I, I need to figure out if it's a, a Wi-Fi or a word connection that's uh, causing problems. But sounds like you've covered this one pretty well. Yeah, I think you picked right up. and It was amazing. He was like, you know, you, you said it was cost and value and Ken just picked up from there. It's like almost one mind. But uh, but regardless, um, I think uh, I think that the points are, uh, I think, well taken and uh, the observation around the fact that costs, especially given what we're going going potentially going to go into, hopefully not too bad, um, in terms of a potential recessionary recessionary pressures, um, that if you hit one gig or if you, even if you hit a couple of hundred megabits, that that's sufficient in most cases. And what you're looking for is cost and also probably reliability. Um, but let me ask Charles, and I think maybe the next slide can help with that, which is, um, you know, what are the key attributes of the offerings that you're seeing get traction in the marketplace and you know like what types of fwa offerings are 
uh, consumers and businesses uh, most interested risk interested in? Yeah, well, as Narottam said, most of the net new ads in the US have been on fixed wireless access. So the the formula of cost value and the you know the consumers are looking for that reliability and they're looking for that um, you know other attractions like you know uh, fixed price contracts, no hidden increases second year. Um, and the speed cost, right? And it's key for service providers to retain customers. So there, there is a, a requirement now to have all these factors present, right? You have to have cost value. So selling top line speeds is becoming less important than the other factors of overall uh, services that are offered in the home, the stickiness of just, you know, reliable broadband. And then obviously, you know, I think consumers are tiring a little bit of getting that increase in contracts after year one. So that's, that, that's been one of the biggest drivers for the increase in, in the net new ads in North America, particularly, right? That, that package of, of new services. Um, yeah, no, I think that's, that's definitely important. I, I know for me, I, I have fixed wireless access from two providers here. I'm, I'm a little paranoid on top of my cable. <laughs> I can't get fiber. I mean, but rightly so. Look at what happened with Charles. See, um, but anyhow, so, <laughs> but, but but fundamentally, I think I, you know. And and when we had the power outages in California, thank God I had two providers because one of them, you know, the cell tower was running out of battery, and I had to go to the other one. So, you know, fixed wireless access can be a huge. I mean, that one saves it saved my work, right? In, in essence, so it, it that availability and it, it is cost effective. Generally speaking, you know, fifty sixty dollars a month. That's that's well worth the price, given what you get out of it and the simplicity, right? Um, Just on, so, the, on the backup service though, right? It is it's a little bit of a dilemma, right? If you're offering a gigabit pond service and then you're offering a reliability feature, you know, consumers really want the reliability on the wired network. So it is a balance of how much you charge for that reliable, reliability service, right? There's unbreakable broadband, stormproof broadband. There are marketing yes. terms on it, right? But it's that balance again of, if you're selling a primary service as a word solution and you have a backup solution, then there's that balance of cost, right? Do you charge for it on a monthly basis when you're not using it? Do you charge when you're using it? And so that's another another um, factor because ultimately most US networks are pretty reliable, right? The average out outage time across the entire US is only five hours per year. Um, but there are areas, particularly where I am in Georgia, for example, where it is prone to tree falls and with, with rainy weather mm -hmm. um, and that can be a whole day of outage, right? When uh, tree falls mm -hmm. on, on uh, overlying cables or, or power, right? Uh, so so it depends on where you live, I guess, is, is also the importance of the backup services. Sure. No, that, that is very true. And I, I think that the, the new joke would be if a tree falls in the forest, you know, you know, and no one's there to hear it, that, it, you know, I only care if it takes, takes down my fiber or it takes, takes down my fixed wireless <laughs> access, right? I think, but, but fundamentally, it's important. But, but you know, a couple of other things, that, which is that, you know, in terms of um, the, the right strategy, I think we've talked on, you know, on this slide, you know, some of the key elements, right, to getting people hooked. And I am clearly one of those that are hooked. I think Narothams, rolling out strategies to get people hooked on those on top of other offerings as well. Um, but one of the key questions around is that, what's the nature of workloads and use cases? I mean, we've talked a bit, a bit about the connectivity, the reliability, the coverage, the ease of you know buying it, canceling it when you don't need it. But what are you guys seeing in terms of the workloads and use cases for fixed wireless access? I'll go to Ken first and I'll come back to the rest of you. Ken. Let me, I want to make sure I understand the question. What are we seeing in regards to the key workloads that are actually, you know, we've, yeah, we, we've talked a lot about fixed yeah, wireless okay. and that's pretty cool, but I think, yeah, you know, so, the workload... so it's really interesting and, and I, I'm going to be very curious on Arotham's answer to this question, but what's, what's, yeah. what's certainly interesting, obviously, is the consumer uptake and, and which we've all seen, you know, across the U.S. by multiple uh, service providers, um, it's simply in regards to providing what you would think of as your normal home broadband. But the, the curious aspect of this is really what it does for small businesses as well. And those, you know, strip malls and other types of environments that, are, you know, are a little, in some cases, a little more complicated or you have very limited choices if you're part of a, of a, of a, of a, of a, of a building that's got multiple tenants or whatever the, 
the case may be. So really looking at it from, uh, you know, if you, the profile of the customers, um, you know, we're very intrigued with where a small business can go with this the, and what applications they can run. They can, they can do anything they need to, including running, you know, all of their, you know, credit card services and cash machines and cash registers and everything else that they would, they would need to typically do. Whereas obviously with a home, it's, there's no difference in regards to the applications you're going to run. You're not going to limit yourself with fixed wireless in any way. So I think that was the gist of where you're going with the question, but yeah. if not, I'd, I'd, yeah, I'd I like so. to hear Nero's, Nero's yeah, I, I think that, that's true. I think one of the key things is that and, and that, and maybe we'll talk a bit about that, which is given the fixed price offerings, which I think we had to do, right, as we just discussed to get the uptake, uh, and the consumers don't really care. They just run your regular workloads, whether it's YouTube or Netflix or Disney Plus streaming. Right. I'm happy to do it over fixed wireless because it doesn't cost me extra, right? Now, on the other side, it, <laughs> it, it may be a little different, right, in terms of the cost uh, profile. For retail, it's high value transactions, right? I got that credit card, PCI, you know, type credit card transaction. Sure, right? That's low bandwidth, but high value. On the other side, I'm watching, I don't know, you know, the, the third rerun of, you know, pick your favorite, you know, Star Wars series. And that is maybe not as high value as, you know, a, credit card transaction for a ten dollar loaf of bread bread, right? So Narotha, what's your take on that? What what kind of workloads and use cases are you seeing on your side as the provider of fixed wireless access? Yeah, so I, I think Ken covered uh, some of them. So I, I'll I'll say like uh, we are definitely seeing to your point, Roy, uh, the, the capacity needs of FWA users are very different than a mobile user, right? So one thing that we have to keep in mind is how do you balance the relatively high capacity needs of fixed wireless access users with overall network economics and profitability. That may mean harmonizing subscriber loading across the footprint with our deployed capacity and network build plans. Uh, and here I would say you need all three layers of the spectrum, low, mid and high band to have a product that really meets the needs of a customer in terms of coverage, reliable connectivity and speed. But in terms of the use cases, I think people want to stream, people want to use it from their home uh, for a plethora of users, like doing their homework or doing or streaming a, a web ch a channel of their interest or browsing the net. And we got to make sure that the service that we provide can actually serve and uh, serve them uh, and provide a best experience to them so that they can be satisfied with the service and meet their needs. There is no difference between a wired broadband user and a fixed wireless access broadband user. Now, there, it was defined before as things like speed, burst speed, latency, and other factors maybe, right? But because LTE technology with carrier, ag carrier ag uh, aggregation, as well as now... No. And then you have millimeter wave, right? You you have you have the ability to put higher capacity. And then as we said, because consumers now are not um are not um you know seeing applications that require more than two hundred megabits down and fifty megabits up, for example, um that's when you now fixed wireless access has become let you know much more accepted as a as a, a media, right? It has more legs to come with millimeter wave access and drive even higher speed. Obviously, you have to have smaller cells. Smaller cells will drive higher capacity too. Um, so it's it's now that it's now these factors we're seeing here, right? Where it's a has you know no hassle install, instant on. You can just pop the fixed wireless access device into the home. Obviously, planning goes on before that to see ahead of time what kind of what kind of um, self install non non external service bandwidth you have. So all, all those factors now are coming together. I think to, be able to make it a very acceptable high speed, low latency service for a lot of consumers, right? Who, who just don't want those contracts particularly and, and are, are more cost conscious, right? And that, that's been the key factor. Yeah, no, agreed. And that's, I think that was the thing I, I was thinking 50 bucks, all you can eat that, that actually changes the equation, right? When I saw that, I'm like, yeah, sure. Right. Give me two of those. Right. Um, <laughs> which in fact is what I did, right. Um, because it, it's a no brainer, right? It's one thing is $150, right? You think hard about that, but at $50 and you know, I need it for my business and the kids need it for work for, for their homework and school. 
it's a no brainer, right? I, I mean, obviously speaking as relatively privileged, you know, we, I mean, there are places where there is a digital divide. There are people who are still not able to afford it, where $50 a month is still very expensive, right? Given all the other things they have to spend money on. So I realize that that's the case, but, but yeah, no, I think it, it is a reasonable price um, uh, at, at this point in time. So, so speaking of which, you know, given we've started rolling this out, it's been a couple of years. I mean, obviously in the last 12 to 18 months, it's really taken off in terms of fixed wireless access. Let's talk about the deployment journey and the learnings collectively, right? And from the carrier side, as well as from the networking vendor side. So I know we've talked a little bit about the deployment models already, and Narotham, you know, elegantly talked about the low, mid, mid and high in terms of spectrum utilization, but there certainly are other uh, considerations in that model as well, harmonizing the model across subscribers, across not just the multiple spectrums, but multiple access methods. So um, given that we that actually the folks at CompGup had a really nice slide that, that shows some of the evolution and the learnings, let, let's start with that. Let's start with, you know, what of the what early deployment models are we seeing in the market? Um, and then I'll go to Narotham and get the care considerations and what are some of the early learnings there? Um, and then we'll go over to Ken, and I'm sure you know uh, there'll be additional points of view. So, so let's start there. And again, gentlemen, feel free to go ahead and click, double click on any of the slides that you think help, helps you make your point. But let's start with with Charles first. What early deployment models are we seeing in the market in terms of the learnings? Um, I, th I think at the moment we're, we're looking at um, using the current cell sizes to drive sub six gigahertz economics. Right? Again, there's a lot of customers that within the current cell sites that are there can actually get you know 200 megabits and above service without driving to to um, smaller cell sites there's mm -hmm. you know the nirvana we want of the self-install where there's no additional external antenna be it self-install or technician install right that just instant on put it in and it just works that's been part of the foundation of say t-mobile's kind of growth over the last uh, couple of years right so mm -hmm. So the antenna comes in secondly, then then Narotam and his colleagues will do planning as to where those sweet spots of opportunity are, bring cell sizes smaller perhaps. But the, the thing about um, doing that is that you're also building the optical network deeper and deeper. So as you cluster customers on fixed wireless access for sharing your mobile in your spectrum infrastructure with mobile at home, you have this next stage in the build out. You, you, you now have maybe 25 customers clustered on a particular cell and mm -hmm. the economics then of running fiber to, to the to the home for those customers becomes much better then, right? You have fiber deep now and you can run fiber right the way through to the customer. So there, there are a number of stages and a number of chapters to play out in this uh, deeper uh, optical network to support fixed wireless access um, in the next, next three, four years. Yeah, that, that's an interesting observation, right? Fixed wireless access is a precursor to making the business case to run fiber all the way to, to the homes because you actually have the business and the justification to, to do that. It's yeah, the customer's connected, yeah. So just, yeah. Yeah, just run, run fiber. That's a, that work order into US Cellular is a much easier one than saying we have a speculative no customers in this area, right? We have 2,500 right. paying customers. So it, right. becomes a, it becomes a real option you can exercise. Yeah, no, definitely. Narotham, what, what, what do you see um, in terms of the carry consideration side and what are some of the early learnings given, in, um, I know you shared some already, but you know, what other early learnings have you, do you have for fixed wireless access rollout? Yeah, sure. And, and I think Charles makes a good point of, uh, in terms of the uh, installations and the coverage models that he's uh, shared with us on the slide. So I'm going to build a little bit on that one. So first I would say, I would start off by saying that the needs of the FWA customers are quite different from the traditional mobile users. So we need to, as a carrier, we need to have the ability to answer questions on the smart home, how we can synchronize delivery of product with installation services, and how can we merchandise a non-device centric product offering. Uh, the other significant learning uh, for us has been the broad appeal of fixed wireless, across, fixed wireless access across a diverse set of consumers. Uh, frankly, initially we thought this as a largely uh, rural underserved play, but what we're seeing mm -hmm. is a momentum across our footprint, including in areas where consumers have other choices. Uh, the 
place where I would go and I would build upon what Charles said is like the installation point of it. So the learning is that we need to have field services capability to be able to locally respond to customer installation and support challenges. With the indoor unit, I think that's very well addressed. But you, mm -hmm. you to serve better and from a capacity angle, you need a combination of both indoor and outdoor units. So for the outdoor units, we still have a, a challenge in terms of uh, how do we do self-install uh, in, in a better economic fashion. And here's what I would call out to the industry for a better collaboration and creative solutions because we need chipset makers, we need device makers, we need the RAND vendors to come together and come up with solutions that can make the life easy for the customer from an installation point of view and yet provided a much better economics. So those are some of the learnings that uh, from from our perspective. Yep, makes sense. Ken, anything to add to that? And feel free no, to go well, to the slides. I'll, I'll yeah. yeah, I'll be very I'll be very brief. What, what I could tell you is that when we entered into the fixed wireless access market, you know, four years ago or so with our first CBRS product, our 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 one hundred percent was a target towards what we would call suburban deployments, right? It was bringing it in from rural into the suburban areas for exactly um, the, uh, as it was described by Narotham and, and Charles. And, and, uh, and that really gave us our first glimpse on how this would work in regards to <coughs> the market accepting truck rolls or not. And, and there really is no full market growth if you have to roll a truck every time, right? It's going gonna, it's gonna to be limited based on that. So coming up with better and better ways to do everything indoors, if you have to go external, do it with an antenna, do it very simply, do it easy. Um, the fewer truck rolls, the bigger the market's going to uh, expand. So, yeah, absolutely. I think that that makes sense and good learnings uh, for sure. Let me go to a couple mm -hmm. of slides uh, here that, that I think, you know, that, that we've have talked about previously as a team. Um, and I want to see if there's any add ons that you want to make. And I know there, there is a next slide after this one. I want to because we have questions coming. In fact, we have a very active audience. So keep it up, audience. We have a lot of uh, comments and Q&A and, and everything coming in. So we really appreciate that. Um, but uh, but anything that, you know, you know, Charles or Ken, you want to add in terms of this slide here? And then I want to go to the next slide, which has which actually helps answer some of the questions that come in. I, I, I'll jump in first and just say that, you know, I think the requirement for reliability is a no brainer now, right? Again, when we ran surveys of a couple of thousand people, right? 51% said immediately they put their hands in their pockets for some reliability with 33% the medium level, which usually means you have a decent market. So again, yes. it's a function of what the cost and what the type is. But not only are we seeing devices emerge that connect in on ethernet or USB as backup and also even um, leveraging smartphones in the home, but we're also seeing the major software stacks now add the support for for multi WAN. And um, so, in our case, for example, we use RDK um, mm -hmm. and Purple Open WRT systems, and those open source com um, solutions are now driving hard for what's usually termed something like modem manager or cell manager um, as a function, and that now is supporting the ability to do failover. Um, to the um, the backup um, uh, fixed wireless access solution. So again, it's the economics of it, ergonomics of it, but now the software stacks are aware of it. it. Does not have to be hitless, but certainly the experience of having a dedicated device that uses the same Wi-Fi in the gateway and not the hotspot on your phone, which is a different level of performance of Wi-Fi for the home. That's the key application that we're seeing um, uh, us and others kind of drive to now implement for companies like um, the Rotis company. Yeah, I think it makes, makes a lot of sense in terms of that one device and rel and connectivity is becoming a lot more important, right? And so I think, you know, not just for businesses, but for consumers as well. And without that, you can't do anything. Well, not that you can't do anything, but as we've learned in all the power outages and all that, that has been hitting the, the, across the United States, when your connectivity goes out, it's it's really difficult. In fact, when I run my low power unit, I have a portable generator. It only goes to two places. It goes to the central console to keep connectivity up in the house and the Wi-Fi, and it goes to the fridge to protect the food. And that's it. 
that's the only two things I protect. So it's, it's interesting. I'm sure that a lot of households around the US like, like, like us, right? Which is connectivity has now become critical, right? Communications, you know, work, you know, even entertainment and news, right? That's become like the key. Um, it, it's the, the, the old emergency portable radio that you, you know, you sort of hang crank to, to, to get, you know, news. It's, it, you got to get to the internet now. It's a little different, right? And so, um, reliable yeah, team. In a post-COVID world, right, you're, we're dealing with much more uh, of, a, of a market of what you need, a high reliability work from home type of configurations, right? And that, that was yes. not the case before COVID, right? It was, uh, you know, you That's get, true. you know, three, four, five nines of reliability on your main broadband. Consumers were, would not want to hear about having to pay anything extra for failover. If it, if it goes down a few hours a year or a day a year, you survive, right? Mm -hmm. But now yes. it's like, I can't afford to miss that day willing to cover it companies are willing to cover it there's it's a it, it, mm -hmm. we're in a different world right now and if this is an we important are. topic there's a whole business we case uh, at, uh that you know business cases that have to be worked out in regards to the cost of that additional hardware to be able to support that whether the service provider can eat it whether the consumer should have to cover it as charles was referring to but but the demand is definitely growing um as a result of of the times yeah for sure Sure. I know that the companies do allow uh, employees to re basically get reimbursement for additional capabilities to get them more reliable, right? That That's definitely the case out there. Right now. Um, now, we had a question here around a couple of questions that I think relate to the slide, and maybe, gentlemen, you could cover it. Uh, one is um, that there's a comment that says here, and I'll just address it because uh, the audience was uh, in. Uh, this is why his name fixed wireless seems con contradictory. Well, I guess, <laughs> I mean, yes, kind of, but it, you know, um, your, your, your home unit is slightly less mobile than your mobile phone. I guess it's, it's all relative. Um, and if, you know, Narotham or <laughs> Charles or Kenyon to comment on that one, that's, that's an, I, I thought that was a fun question. Not quite no, I, I, no, I think you hit it on the nail because it's not mobile. It's a fixed device. Sometimes like, like an indoor Wi-Fi router, it's the same equivalent of that, where you have a fixed wireless access router. Or sometimes you may have an external unit, like a dish, on the outside of your home, so you're not moving. So that's why it's called fixed wireless. Yep. That's but I think, I think Rai expressed it well. It's not as mobile. It's very infrequently mobile, but the fixed wireless access solutions that have been, have been sold for a while have been sold as movable to different locations now there's caveats on that in terms of performance right if you have a cabin up in the woods and you're you're, you're getting it for that you better check to see what kind of service you have at the moment um but we but we have seen the importance of fixed wireless access for second homes and the ability to turn on and off the service rather than a, a permanent kind of 12 month service that's that's a niche in the market i think that the fixed wireless access um, solutions have have actually um uh, you know what came into, um, mm. so I so I think. It, but as Northam said, it's it's typically that's fixed to a house in its duration. But I think the current um, some of the current fixed wireless access providers allow you to move that to a secondary location. But again, the caveat is that do you have the uh, the service there or not? Correct. That that's true. That that is true because uh, for for the carriers, sometimes they it's so based on the fact that they have fellow capacity in the in in the regions near you and they sell it to you at least initially it was a lot more targeted right and over time now i think increasingly they're going to be a bit more open with fixed wireless access as capacity builds up um related question here uh around spectrum since we have a slide up here and there, there's two related questions um one is uh, what was it about the it's not necessarily affordable spark. the question says what was it the affordable spectrum in the U.S. allows CSP to offer this service. Um, that's the question itself, and I'll, I'll let. Obviously, it wasn't necessarily just affordable spectrum, but I'll let you guys talk about that. And then the other question I'm looking through the list of questions here is uh, the other one has to talk. It talks about sort of speed and latency uh, in terms of fixed wireless access, right? What, what's available today? What are we seeing in terms of latency and speeds? And we talked a bit, a little bit about that, but given we have this slide up, maybe if you could characterize it. So question number one, was it, what was it about a spectrum situation that drove fixed wireless access? And then number two, what kind of, uh, speed, you know, quality of service reliability are we seeing with fixed wireless access offerings today? Sure. I can start on the spectrum and then I'll have Charles and Ken chime in. 
here. Yeah. So sure. on the spectrum side, like there are two buckets, like license and unlicensed spectrum, right? So some people have started with CBR as general GAA, which is unlicensed spectrum. And then you also have licensed spectrum, uh, both uh, for like C-band, uh, low band, millimeter wave, and et cetera, where license spectrum, you, you have some benefits because uh, you manage the interference much better. You provide a much better quality of service because it's controlled and not shared, right? Uh, so th those are the kind of spectrum that enables a fixed wireless access. But as I said, again, I mean, you need all, all three bands to have a good product. You need the low band for ubiquitous coverage. You need the mid band for capacity as well as uh, good experience and high band in certain targeted areas where you can get high speed capacity and provide an offload to the mid band. So. Okay, Charles, can if you want to share any thoughts from your side. I, I think I, just jump in, Hannah. Can I, I? I was. I'm very much into the the whole latency and round trip stuff, right? As a as a, a guy looking at the future of the home and immersive video and where the metaverse is going. You know, we we use certain numbers, right? So less than 15 millisecond round trip time gives you all the immersive video you're ever going to do for the next 20 years, right? Because of our physics of our eyes and how our brain works, right? So we're trying to get to that magic number. Less than 35 millisecond round trip is fine for every service. It can be even for gaming because of the metronome of, it's it's more jitter that's the issue. Greater than 40 milliseconds, we tend not to not to like that, right? From, uh, we try to engineer our networks under it. And then on the speed side, there's um, this driver to get gigabit level speed, but we know up to 400 megabits is green, right? That's every service we have kind of fits in that and, and even 200 megabits probably. And um, so at the, at currently at the moment, the mobile and fixed wireless access spectrum and cells don't really use uh, the, the, the cost settings that are there for, I don't typically use the cost settings that are there for being able to, to separate uh, differentiated services one from the other. It's more done on a congestion and, a, and a, a, a planning and a capacity planning perspective, right? Um, so there's no reason why with OFDMA on a, an LTE or 5G network that you can't reach those, those uh, latency uh, numbers particularly. But there is cell congestion, right? And then you can either add more cell capacity or you can start using some of those QCI, QF, FI controls for differentiated services, right? And, and then manage as we do in other wired technologies. That's where it's it's all going on the wired technologies, right? And Wi-Fi. We we use cost settings to say that you know mom's laptop is more important than the kids watching Netflix, right? So let's give give her a few extra a bits so she's working from home. And um, so there there is so there's nothing to stop OFDMA based five G because obviously we have five G looking at you know very low latencies as well from a um, a car to car solution or or device to sell, right? So one millisecond being feasible even in, the, in, in, in implementation. So, so the point of this slide, I guess, was to show that there's nothing to stop fixed wireless access being able to do immersive video services in, in the home. Yep, no, I think that's, and speaking of the home, let's move to the home. Um, let's talk about the fixed wireless access and the home network, that was perfect layout. So let's, let's go to this slide here and I'm gonna start by asking the question. So. Um, I'm going to go to Ken first, and then we'll come to Charles. Uh, so do consumers and businesses expect Wi-Fi capabilities to be bundled into the FWA gateways? Um, and do they expect like, the highest end capabilities in those devices? Ken? That's a great question. Um, whether you're talking about wired or wireless, that has been a, uh, that has been a global uh, 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 question that's been out there in different service providers and different consumers have different viewpoints. At the end of the day, the most economical way to do it is a fully integrated gateway. If you know you're going to need WAN access and integrated Wi-Fi, um, it, it's a, it, it makes a lot more sense to have one device delivered, self-installable um, with full Wi-Fi capabilities. However, there are plenty of deployment models where you wanna bring just a modem you know, into the equation and connect to either a larger switch or, or some other you know, more business-oriented Wi-Fi scenario. Um, so we, we've, uh, we built our product portfolios to be able to go in, in either or direction. And when you look at the, when you look at it globally, the world is very much split on this discussion. Clearly, if you're putting an outdoor 5G or LTE modem on the outside of a house and you bring wire in, you're going to have a separate Wi-Fi Ethernet gateway that's going to handle the uh, inside Wi-Fi. So it's by default a two box um, solution. 
either way, you, what you're really looking to do is match um, to what makes the most sense, the Wi-Fi performance to whatever the WAN performance is. And, and as the slide indicates, right, we're, we're on the very beginnings of, a, of the next you know, evolution in Wi-Fi to Wi-Fi 7, um, which will bring a significant amount of uh, uh, performance opportunity, if you will, to home network architectures. But when you're looking at where we are still with LTE and 5G, you know, Wi-Fi 6 is, is more than good enough right now in a balanced uh, environment to, to service that marketplace. But, but over time, just like any other wired network, eventually things will evolve uh, to Wi-Fi 7 as it commoditizes, as, as the opportunities to do more integration inside of the box occur, you'll see more integrated um, solutions that are that are based on 5G and Wi-Fi 7. Um, for now, Wi-Fi 6 seems to be the sweet spot, cost-wise and mm -hmm. performance-wise, to based on the services that are that Narotham is and others are bringing into the into the homes. But that will grow, and as it grows, the, you want to match it with the performance capabilities of, of Wi-Fi 7. Yeah, I think I think that makes sense. And what you point out, you know, as a vendor uh, and obviously serving the needs of the carriers and the consumers and the businesses, that, that balancing act is, is, is kind of critical. I know, Charles, earlier you talked about the different services available, right, on the broadband side of the connection, but likewise on the internal side of the connection, I'm sure that comes into play as well. So, Charles, anything to add in terms of the trade-offs and decisions that, that you guys are making? I know Ken's already talked about some of those, but Charles, anything to add about, you know, how do you see the trade-offs? Both on the WAN side of the equation and on the land side of the equation. Yeah, I mean, the, you know, and the cost of five G is still not as you know where where it is obviously for LTE. So the, mm -hmm. the addition of a five G modem is still the largest um, uh, you know bomb item and, and capital item within the the gateway. Um, I've heard many fixed wireless access providers say that they would invest more in 5G first before they put more uh, Wi-Fi 7 features in there. But you need the Wi-Fi 7 features as well, right? So it's that it's that balance of CapEx because there is a delinquency on some of the routers that go out there, right? Because if someone does have this no contracts incident on fee, you, you, you ask for them to return it, right? So there, that device has to be, it works within certain cost uh, factors, right? So it's a balance of, of of the capital cost of it, right? But, but as Ken said, we are seeing both the LTE lift, the 5G, some discussions about adding, you know, getting millimeter wave running in there again. And then on the Wi-Fi side, as Ken said, dual band Wi-Fi 6 is the workhorse, right? And, and a good solution that connects all our devices, right? With, with new six gigahertz devices slowly penetrating the home. Cell phone turns every two and a half years, a laptop every 3.8 years. So in the next five years, they'll have turned, right? So then you'll need those Wi-Fi 7 connections. Um, and if, if you just advance to one slide before Narotham gets a chance to also jump in on this, oh, if you absolutely. advance to the next slide, right? Um, so we, we, we kind of figured this out a little bit ahead of time, right? And we realized that the dual band fixed wireless access gateways from a CapEx perspective are the most, um, the, most uh, the best economics, right? But if someone mm -hmm. wants access to the six gigahertz network for gaming or for some low latency service or just for some, you know, connect two sides of their home together on a six gig mesh. We created a device right. called an M6, right, which can click into an existing dual band solution and create ad hoc six gigahertz networks for the gamer in the house, or even for mom or dad who are working on a private six gigahertz network. And um, mm -hmm. so in that case, then the CapEx is incisive, right? It goes where the application is. It does, it goes where the gamers are and it goes where the, the work from home need. So somebody who really wants the most reliable work from home solution, you get a dual band fixed wireless access gateway from a company like Comscope. You add an M a couple of M6s for your gamer to have his own private six gig, two, late, two millisecond latency network, and you add a backup. Um, well, in that case, you, 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 know, you might have a wired solution with a backup FWA, right? But, but it's, it's that, that extra um, access to six gigahertz that we put in as a, a, a very surgical device led solution versus six gigahertz in every single device and uh, even if the customers aren't really using it much yet yeah that no, makes a lot of sense that's exactly what i have i have a six gig running mesh um and then the uh, the dual bands you know serving the devices and that you know exactly what i have that's the fixed wireless access dual because i'm paranoid but yeah absolutely yeah. <laughs> Narutham, what are you seeing is, is that what your customers are expecting or asking for from both a obviously consumer and an enterprise standpoint 
Yeah, so I think uh, Charles and Ken hit on, on some key points here on the device side. Yes, I do agree that the price point of the device needs to get more economical. Uh, and I'm sure with over time with volume, uh, they will get there. So in terms of uh, what we're seeing in, uh, from customers, I mean, earlier, initially when we started the FWA, it was pr primarily focused like on underserved customers with the best effort mentality, right? But as the base grew in more well-served areas, uh, where customers may have choice, other choices as well. Now we have to ensure that we have a service that allows multiple users within a household uh, to do what they need to do, like uh, browsing the net, doing the homework, etc. Support-wise, uh, they they will be expecting us to be engaging like an ISP who's well versed in home networking challenges and the in-home mm -hmm. Wi-Fi environment. That means for us, we'll have to support the uh, uh, we have to extend the support environment inside the home. And to that end, we are actually partnering with our tech care providers who have already developed broad knowledge bases in supporting the home technology environment. So that's something that is a learning and what we are seeing as well. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. If you're shipping the devices and you're looking inside the home, then the homeowners expect you to then become IT experts for their home as well, right? Which is a... Um, plus on downside or a opportunity to improve service or make it more sticky, right? Look at it both ways. Right? Um, definitely. Um, I'm going to move on to the last theme here. And again, uh, audience, go ahead, you know, uh, ask questions. We're going to try to address those along the way. I see a couple of questions for theme number four, and we'll address those in theme number four, but keep those coming. You don't have to wait till the very end for the dedicated Q&A because uh, we're happy to answer those along the way. I'm going to um, not spend too much time. I'm going to skip over the slide. I think we touched a little bit about Wi-Fi 7 and what's coming down the pike. I think Ken already touched on that. And so with that, I'm going to go into theme number four, which is evolution of fixed wireless ac access. What can we expect in the near future? Um, and once again, I bring up that all important architecture slide in terms of evolution of connection. Um, and and maybe ask uh, Narotham this time, right? With, so will the early traction and uptake of fixed wireless access, as a, it's a leading 5G use case, right? Um, will, will we see that continue? Um, and how do you think the scene with, you know, fiber to the premises, you know, how would that play out? And what are you seeing at US Cellular? Sure. So first, we we fully expect to see the early traction in fixed wireless access to continue over the coming years, like four or five years, especially as the networks mature and are optimized. Uh, one thing that pandemic taught us is that we need ubiquitous mobile coverage and broadband connectivity in rural America. And to address that problem, uh, I mean, you need fixed wireless access. It cannot be solved just with fiber alone, uh, because 5G fixed wireless access provides broadband connectivity uh, to homes uh, in, a, in a much more economical way and, and time to market, a faster time to market, I would say. But, but if, and also the fiber deployments in rural, very rural areas can be challenging depending on the terrain and other conditions, right? But I, I, but I do believe both fiber and, uh, and fixed wireless access ha can have a place in the marketplace. So for example, if you're in dense urban areas, fiber may make more sense. If you're in rural areas, suburban areas, fixed wireless access may make more sense. So they both they both coexist and complement each other depending on the market makeup. Uh, so that, that's how I that, that's how we see about it. Yeah, so 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 Korea would be an example of that. There's so much fiber and there's so much density in, in the cities that fixed wireless access is not the same opportunity as, as the US as a you know primary connection for rural as Rotham said as, and also as competition to where there's only one or two other um, service providers right so that's that's a, each market is different but certainly South Korea stands out to me as one of the markets where it's less of a priority for the the, the mobile operators it makes a lot of sense well, right in, if, contrast if, if, in the US there's oh I'm sorry Roy. oh go ahead Ken go no go ahead as I say, in, in contrast in the U.S., right, the number of homes that are passed by fiber, just passed, not connected by fiber, is right. still far below the total size of the market, right? So there's mm -hmm. there's plenty of opportunities. Still a lot of copper being, you know, uh, connecting homes, not fiber. So 5G has got, uh, or, or fixed wireless, I should say, has 
plenty of opportunity for quite a long time. And, and I agree with Narotham that there'll always be a coexistence. Um, the, the applications may change over time, uh, uh, but that'll be, a, it'll, it's going to take a while for fiber to get out there far enough to really uh, take fixed wireless, if you will, out of play. I don't, I don't really don't see that happening as much. And, and then the real question is what's going to happen with a millimeter wave at the end of the day? Yeah. Will, will, the, right. will the physics of millimeter wave actually be resolved in such a fashion that, that We'll be able to use it for um, what I will call cost-effective <laughs> fixed wireless um, access. Mm -hmm. um, right mm -hmm. now, it's just not there. Although, if you do connect over it um, using an outdoor setup and and then penetrate the walls with Ethernet, you know, it, it, it's fast. <laughs> it's very fast. Oh, it is. It's oh, just very impressive. Really no, I've seen it. I've seen it at other people's house, just not mine. Yeah, no, it's, it's exactly. I mean, just a couple of blocks that way. There's millimeter wave. You know, I've driven past. I see the little cells, and I'm like, you know, they're lucky to get that. I don't get that, right? Here, I all I have is is cable. I don't have fiber mm -hmm. and I have DSL, but I'm not going to pay for the DSL, right? So I have two fixed wireless access, and I and then I have cable, and fiber is not running through here, even though I live in uh, arguably the hot, you know, Silicon Valley, and I. I can't get it. I can't get fiber. That's just a reality. Right. So Ken, you're absolutely right. I feel that every day. Um, speaking of <laughs> convergence on that, you know, sort of the wireline wireless options on the on the WAN side. Um, what do you see in terms of convergence? Right? Do you see that that access infrastructure converging? Can we expect you know a single provider to provide us with this seamless magical? You know, it doesn't matter whether it's fixed wireless or whether it's it's fiber or, or cable. I I have that unified one IP infrastructure. Do you see that happening, Ken? Uh, so uh, do I see it? It actually, uh, it, it, it's quite challenging to be very honest with you. It's not, it sounds like it's kind of, it's straightforward, but the way most mm -hmm. networks are set up, even if it happens to be a service provider that's offering both full wired and wireless, they're typically uh, very uh, separate networks. They're trying to get together with a common core, then over time that, you know, that that would certainly help, but the access networks are still obviously quite different and being able to multiplex and demultiplex off of from a, from a home with two different WAN connections coming in and provide additional broadband. Um, it, it is a technical challenge. I, I, it is being used in certain places uh, around the world, but not hasn't been widely adopted yet. Um, I think if I was to predict it, I would say that if you can already get a fiber connection to your house, why do you need to multiplex it to a fixed wireless connection, using it as failover or backup probably makes more sense. So, mm -hmm. you know, my opinion, Ken Haas's opinion is, I don't really see that taking over very, very quickly anytime soon. Charles and Narotham, if you disagree, feel free. <laughs> Charles, no? Well, I, I put up this slide to try to, you know, the, the backdrop to what Ken was saying there, because as Ken said, they are, typically two different networks. And yeah. if you take the failover application, I mean, to do something in a minute for failover on a very infrequently used failover on a WER network versus do it hitless, the cost of doing it hitless is just not worth it in my opinion, right? It just is not an issue. Making sure that the same Wi-Fi on the gateway is used to connect that range in your home uh, versus using a, your, you know, your cell phone as a hotspot is, is a, mm -hmm. a key application. The DSL, uh, you know, Ken's been through this for many years too, right? And I'm sure Neurotham has as well. With DSL networks, there's always been an idea of, of augmenting them with fixed wireless access. So you, you use your DSL network and your fixed wireless access network to get you speed. But guess what? Mm -hmm. the, the fixed wireless access is doing 200 megabits anyway. Yeah. So yeah. the cost of putting two networks together with a backend that's unifying a 3GHP, uh, you know, DSL backend with a 3GHP backend yeah. is probably you know, you have to give it a real good look there. So, so again, it's those magic numbers that come in, I think in terms of, you know, replace DSL with fixed wireless access might be a, a better option, especially if you're going to augment and are looking at augmenting. So yep. there's, there's a number of cards, but it's that cost of getting two separate networks on the 3GP side and the broadband side to share that IP scope and, you know, understand everything that's, it can be done, but, it's it's maybe not the right investment, um, uh, you know, based on who you are. As a yeah, no, I think that that absolutely makes sense. So, um, uh, in the last four minutes that we have here, just a couple of things. Uh, I'll start with maybe Charles. You know, in terms of looking ahead and, and looking forward, 
what are considerations that are outside of CapEx, OpEx? And maybe I'll turn this question over to Narotham too, right? Um, how do you see this evolving um, over the next few years? Um, are there weird things like, you know, free space optics, which one of the uh, questioners came in, you know, do we see things like that, that we've talked about for a long time? Um, and will we see a slowdown in some of the CapEx, OpEx, and will that slow down FWA uptake as well? So I know it's a loaded question, long question, but maybe get Charles to start and then, you know, Narotham and then maybe Ken, you're welcome to jump in as well as we, as we wrap this up. Well, Ken and I have a very kind of home out view rather than the infrastructure in. Um, if you look at the, the home view, I'm sure Ken would share the same opinion, right? That he's gone through two generations of fixed wireless access gateway where the first generation is really, the silicon is designed around supporting a smartphone, not a fixed wireless access gateway. Um, so now, con you know, converging the modem with the host processor with the Wi-Fi, Generation two silicon and generation three silicon is starting to target those very cost optimized kind of architectures, right? Because essentially we had, you know, two subsystems, a fixed wireless access system that was based on phone architectures and a Wi-Fi system that was based on a traditional AP architecture, but now merging the two into a common mm -hmm. processor. So we are hoping that, you know, generation three of fixed wireless access on the WAN side will, will converge that including sub six and millimeter wave. And of course, then it's the it's the the same challenge for a fixed wireless access provider as a, a wired provider in that moving into tri-band Wi-Fi seven incurs additional costs of another radio. That's just the way it is, right? Ten gig physical links on a device. If you're going that speed on, you know, if you put five G at its one gig higher levels, right? Again, we think one gig less is a speed spot, a sweet spot for fixed wireless access gateways. So maybe not make that have to make that investment in 10 gig LAN ports, which is the prerogative these days of XGS PON 10 gig yep. um, gateways. And so, so, so that that's that's the primary capex on the home, and then obviously a good mesh solution in the home, as, as you said. Right, if you can afford a tri-band mesh solution, use six gig as backhaul, it's ideal, right? That's the ultimate yeah. for home Wi-Fi meshing. Offloads five gig to use for your clients, and then over time, next five years, you'll have a significant percentage of six gig devices come in. So uh, that, that's, I guess that's our view, Ken, on it, right, from a, a device perspective. Yeah, I, I'd, I'd like to have Narathan make take the last words here, because I would agree with Charles and not much more to add there. So Narotham, a um, couple of minutes left, two minutes left. You know, what do you see for fixed wireless access in the future? What can we expect um, from carriers like US Cellular and more? Yeah, so we, I think uh, Charles hit on some couple of key points. So first, I would say that we do see fixed wireless access growing, no question about that. And it's a good, uh, good opportunity for us to help bridge the digital divide and provide a good service to the customers. So to, to your question on, on the CapEx side, yeah, so we have to make sure that the economics are still there and we're still profitable. So I, I would say like the there's an opportunity to improve the cost structure, both on the RAN side as well as on the device side. I mean, we as an industry have to come up with the low cost capacity effective solutions to make this happen. On the device side, I agree. I mean, uh, there's an opportunity to make sure that we come up with more self-serve devices, uh, which customer can mount it by themselves. So we can avoid the truck roll, we can avoid the cost, and then the chipset cost needs to go down to make it more economical and affordable for the customers to buy it. Absolutely. And thank you. And with that, I would like to thank the audience for being with us. I know there are a couple of questions we couldn't get to, but we try to work those in along the way. Um, I would say thanks to Comscope. I'm going to put up a slide here that's some of the summary of the key th takeaways that we talked about. Um, so, so obviously the slide was prepared and yeah, knowing sort of the rough directions we would, we would be headed on this panel, even though it was dynamic and interactive. Um, and I know the audience would probably appreciate those key takeaways. So thank you to the Comscope team for actually putting those together. And at this point, I'd like to thank um, again, the, the Fierce and Quetex, Questex folks for having us, Comscope for sponsoring this, Narotham from US Cellular uh, for supporting and being here with, with us. And thank you, Charles, and thank you, Ken. Uh, really appreciate it. And I had a wonderful time, learned a lot, and hope you did too, audience. So thank you. I'll turn it back over to Oliver. Thank you so much, everyone. That was a very interesting discussion. And of course, thank you, Comscope, for sponsoring this session. Make sure you join us back here at 2 p.m. Eastern time, where we'll have our next session, where we'll be discussing industrial milestones achieved so far. See you shortly.